Luke, the 15, 11th chapter, verses 5 through 13. Here we go. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Let's go back to the top. I want to shine the sermonic spotlight on the first portion. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight? Stop. Let's do that one more time because I want to get it in your spirit. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight? Let's talk to God. God, in the name of Jesus right now, it's a preachable moment and I need your help. Speak through me and to me that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Get the glory out of this moment. Cancel every distraction. Cancel everything that would hinder and hold me back from doing what you have assigned on this morning. Thank you for what you're about to do in us, with us, to us, for us, and through us. In the name that is above every other name, we claim this victory in Jesus' name. Let all the redeemed of the Lord shout hallelujah and amen. This will not be a long message, but it will be a powerfully effective message. At least that is my prayer. I want to talk about the subject of friends. I want to deal with friends. Uh, we're in a different season. We're in a difficult season. There's a lot that everybody is enduring and persevering through and pressing their way towards in this season. We, we have experienced things in this season that we're not accustomed to, that we've never experienced in our lifetime. And to even listen and hear my senior saints declare that this is like no other season that they have experienced gives credence and evidence and greater testimony to the fact that we are in a weird time. It is a strange season. And what better thing to have in our arsenal is a good friend to help us make it through it, make it to it, and just get beyond where we are right now. So I thought it not robbery, and I thought it imperative just to take a moment and deal with our relationships, more specifically, our friendships. This text is really not a text about friends more than it is about prayer. If you read the text even prior to verse 5, you will see it is an example given of the model prayer, our Father which art in heaven. Uh, and it is, it is in this same text, this same cutout, that they, they talk about that, that the uh, writer talks about the specificity or the need for, for persistence in seeking God or in prayer. So the text is actually about the persistency of prayer. However, I want to back us out and deal with one thing that is used as an example in the entire text. Yes, it's about persistency in prayer. It's about going to God and being persistent because he will meet you at your turn of need. He will get up and he will meet your need. It is about being diligent and, and honoring God and continually praying. But I want to make sure that you understand I'm focusing on just one portion today. And he said to them, verse 5, and he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight? Let me paraphrase it and put it in, in, in colloquial terms. Which of you has the kind of friend that you can go to at midnight? The text is about prayer and the persistency of prayer, but I'm focusing on that one statement he made. Which of you has a friend that you can go to at midnight. Here's the, here's the thing. Uh, it is not a convenience factor to be friends or to have a friendship. Uh, it doesn't always mean that it's going to happen in, in hours of the normal hours of operation. It doesn't mean that, that the needs will be manifested or made known in the most comfortable or convenient of times. But sometimes, if you have a real friend, you might have to go to them at midnight. Evaluate your relationships. That's the purpose of this whole sermon, this, this, this moment, this time that we're going to spend briefly with one another. Is to, is to push you to a place where you start evaluating your relationships. Have you, 
built strong enough relationships that can handle the nuances of life, that can handle the dynamics of this life, that can handle the the idiosyncrasies and the incidents that will raise up and manifest themselves in your life. Have you developed the right kinds of relationships to be able to make it through this season? Here's Here's an exercise. Let's start with this. Take a moment and list five of your closest friends. Come on. I I, I want you to, whatever title you give them, uh, they may be best friends, second best friend, third best, whatever it is. List your five closest friends. All right. Give them a shout out. Hit them in the chat room. Come on. I'm watching you. Hit them in the chat room. I'm looking too. Hit them in the chat room and say, this person, this person, shout out to, or what's up, or my, my, my BFF, or whatever you want to give it. But, but put your five closest friends Now, I wanted you to list it, and I wanted you to to alliterate it. I wanted you to put it out there, because the next statement is going to be very telling, and it might even be very convicting. So the next statement is simply this. If you hang around these five people, let me say it a different way. If you hang around nine people, that way I'm not specifically calling you out, but if you hang around nine people, and those nine people are broke or broken, I can tell you who will be the tenth person. Yeah, let me try one more time. If you hang around five people, and these five people are broke or broken, I can tell you who will be the sixth person. Because if you want to see your future, look at your list. It is a good indication of what your tomorrow will look like. Proverbs 13 and 20 says it like this in the English Revised Version. It says, be friends with those who are wise and you will become wise. Choose fools to be friends and you will have trouble. Your friendship circle determines what your tomorrows will look like. You might be one friend away from changing your entire destiny. You might be one relational connection away from changing the discourse of your entire life. In Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 26 through 28. I hope you didn't put your Bibles down, your devices down. We're going to be in the word today. Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 26 through 28. Then Saul went to Jerusalem and he tried to join the group of followers. He was trying to join the believers of Christ, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he was really a follower of Jesus. But then comes Barnabas. And Barnabas accepted Saul and took him to the apostles and told them, Saul had seen the Lord on the road and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. Then he said, he said to them boldly, Saul had spoken for the Lord on Damascus. In verse 28, and so Saul stayed with the followers and went all around Jerusalem speaking boldly for the Lord. His whole destiny was changed because one person, one key individual, one friend recognized in him what needed to be recognized and put his life back on the right course. I want to suggest to you that some of you are one friendship away, one right friendship away from your entire destiny being put on the right track. You, you, you have to know the value of this moment. That this is not a sermon that I normally would have thrown here without a series to wrap around it. But God has put this in my spirit today because it's something that you need to hear. Your relationships will determine where you're about to go in this next season. When we start uh, putting things back into a normalcy or at least the semblances of what used to be. We have a new normal and I'm okay with that. But when you start to assimilate back into a routine, a pattern, you've got to be more vigilant in this season because God has used this season to shake off some relationships that should not be there. So in this next season, I want you to be armed and equipped with what you need in order to be more intentional, more astute, more uh, more discerning, and more wise at how you decide and select your new relationships. Why? Because you might be one friendship away 
from God doing something incredible in your next season. So how can you do that? How, what, what, what is it that I need to know, Pastor? I'm so glad you asked. Y'all asked the best questions at this service. So here it is. You ready? There are four friends that you need in your life. Four friends that every individual needs in their lives. I, I don't want you to miss this. This is so important because I, I get, get your pad, your pen, your paper, your notation device, whatever it is that you're going to take notes on. I want you to take notes. Four friends that all of us need. And of course, the best place to find the examples of the types of friends that God assigns and that, that bring your life to a higher height is in the word of God. That is, that, that's the bottom line. And here's what I want you to note, that these are the four friends that I'm going to identify, but there will be other friends and other kinds of friends that show up. So the question that you have to ask on the beginning or on the front end of your assessment is who sent you? Yeah, only two police people could have sent you. Either God sent you or Satan sent you. Either way, that needs to be your first question. If I'm going to decide and determine whether or not you're one of the four that I need, I need to first assess who's, who, who, who's, who sent you. Yeah, so go down your list and begin to ask the question internally. Who sent you? So he, he, here's, here's the first friend that you need. The four friends that everybody needs. Number one, you need, you need a Samuel. Did you catch it? You need a Samuel. In other words, everybody needs a friend that makes you better. Everybody needs a friend that pulls the best out of you. In 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, verses 12 through 13. Again, I'm in the English Revised Version, but 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, verses 12 and 13 says this. Jesse sent someone to get his youngest son. This son was a good-looking, healthy young man like Pastor Norfolk. Uh, very handsome. Don't laugh. The Lord said to Samuel, get up and anoint him. He is the one. Samuel took the horn of the oil with the oil in it, poured it on the special oil on Jesse's youngest son in front of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came on David with great power from that day on. Then Samuel went back to his home to Ramah. Now, here's what I want you to know, that the brothers did not see the value in David. The father sent for all the other brothers, but did not send for David. Because all of them had concluded, based upon their external survey, that there was nothing of value. And surely, if we're talking about anointing somebody king out of Jesse's household, it has to be one of these strong, one of these viral, one of these popular, one of these more tall and handsome, uh, rugged-looking young men. It has to be somebody who has these criteria that, that exist in the hearts and the minds of men. But everybody needs a Samuel that can look through the superficial and still see value in you and pull that value out and it does not have a problem affirming what they see. Samuel, pay attention, was not bothered that he had to anoint David as king. Nowhere in the course of this do they make indication or does the word give us any indication that Samuel was in any way intimidated or was in any way envious of the fact that he had to anoint somebody else the king. He simply went on assignment and says, I'm looking for the one that God has chosen. And it may not be visible to everybody's natural eye, but I'm coming with the spiritual insight of God. And I'm coming looking for whom God confirms in my spirit. And note that he did not have a problem anointing him. Now, I'm about to help you. I, I don't want you to miss this. This is a good point. But some people have a problem when they have to anoint you to be more than them. Did you get it? Let me say it one more time. You got to pay attention to the people that have a problem anointing you to be more than them. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Samuel was secure in his position. 
He knew I am a prophet of God. I have a unique assignment in the body of Christ. There is something that God has uniquely assigned and chosen me to do. And as long as I'm chosen by God, I don't have to look for the affirmation or be threatened by the elevation of somebody else. He was a prophet to the nation, but he didn't worry about anointing someone else to be elevated above him and take his position. He qualified David and still didn't worry about the qualifications for himself. Joseph is an example of this. You know the story of Joseph, and if you don't study it, Joseph, uh, he, was, he wore a coat of many colors. He had the favor of the father. He was loved, and he was beloved by his father, and he had to deal with the envy and the jealousy of his brothers. Well, they had a problem with Joseph's elevation, but this is what I don't want you to miss. They disqualified themselves from being in covenant relationship or in, in, in close relationship with Joseph because they could not handle Joseph's elevation. They couldn't handle the favor that he wore. It was bigger than the coat. It was the favor of God that was upon Joseph's life. It was the gift and the grace of God that was deposited in Joseph's heart. It was what God had given him the capacity to see before anybody else could see it. And because they couldn't handle it, God had to remove him from it. See, when God elevates you, everybody won't be able to go. Let me get this formula in your spirit so you think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which are to try your relationships as though some strange thing has happened. There will be isolation before elevation. No, don't, don't, don't miss that. Put that where you can feel it. There will be isolation before God puts you into elevation. You need people in your life like Samuel who can see what God sees in you and doesn't have a problem identifying it and even celebrating it. That's the kind of friend that you're going to need in this next season. And growth produces contention and separation. Don't miss it. Write it down. Growth produces contention and separation. If you don't believe me, here's another biblical example. Abraham and Lot. When their, when their flocks started to grow, when their favor started to increase, when the increase started happening, when things became so plentiful and so numerous, it bred contention between the camps to the extent that Lot had to leave with his people and they had to find another territory to set up camp. Everyone around you will be able to see it. But the, you don't always see it yourself, but you need people around you who see it and are not threatened by it. So say it with me. I need a Samuel. Look at your list. Go back and check your list. Where's your Samuel? The other thing that other type of friend that you need is everybody needs a Jonathan. You need a friend who helps you find spiritual strength. You need somebody that helps to elevate and increase you in your spirit man. Not just somebody that can give you a few things. Not somebody that just pats you on the back casually. But somebody who knows how to pray for you. Somebody who knows how to encourage you in your weak and your weary moments. You will have weak and weary moments. So you need somebody that knows how to speak the word of God over your life. Somebody that knows how to get a prayer through. Somebody that knows how to encourage you in your spirit man. In 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, verses 15 and 16, David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph. He was afraid because Saul was coming to kill him. But Saul's son, Jonathan, went to see David at Horesh and encouraged him to have a stronger faith in God. He pushed him to get closer to God to be able to handle the pressure of his own father that was trying to hunt him. See, these first two are essential because they're foundational. You need a Samuel, somebody who can, who can see your potential or speak to your potential. And then you need a Jonathan, somebody who ministers to your spirit in your weakness. Let me say it one more time. I don't want you to miss it. Because if you don't have these two, the other two 
build off of the foundation of these two friends that you have in your life. You need a Samuel who can speak to your potential, can see what God has said and God has done and invested inside of you. And you need a Jonathan that can minister to you because the more favor you carry, the heavier your load. Here's what scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. So because I have so much grace, so much favor on my life, I need somebody that can speak to my spirit when it becomes overwhelming or when the load gets heavy. And so the bond was developed between Jonathan and between David because in, John, in David's weak moment, Jonathan had decided, I know how to encourage you. I'm going to speak to you. And I'll speak to you in a way that pushes you not in my presence, but pushes you towards God and pushes you to a place where you remember who your God is. Yeah, you need a, you need a, you need a Samuel and you need a Jonathan. Now, those are the easy two. These two that are about to come, the, these two that I'm about to present, these are the ones that typically cause us issues. These are the ones that we struggle with. It's easy to, to deal with a Jonathan. Jonathan always tells you good stuff and speaks to your potential and says, you can do it. I see how God has anointed you. You're the one. You're chosen. There's something special about you. You need a, you, Samuel, rather. You need a Jonathan. Jonathan is the one that encourages you and says, God got you. You can handle this. Let me pray you through it. Let me minister to you. You, you, you can handle Samuel. You can handle Jonathan. But here's the other two that you need. And these are the two that typically cause us issues. You need, you need a Nathan in your life. Our natural tendency is to hide. If you go back to Genesis and look at Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, whenever the Lord came through and they had gotten to a place or a fallen place, the natural tendency and inclination of our fleshly being is to hide in our weakness or hide in our sin. It, it, it's natural. Just think about it. I, I'll put it in a practical perspective for you. When, when you came in the kitchen and your baby had been in the cookie jar or in the cake and you looked at him and you say, hey, did you eat this cake? Did you go in these cookies? And the first thing out of their mouth is, mm-mm, no. The problem is there's a, a crumb trail leading right up to where they're sitting and they still got the evidence all over their face. Our natural tendency, even as little children, is to hide. That's what Adam and Eve did until you can't hide anymore. Until we realize God is not the kind of God that you're going to be able to cover yourself or hide from him. So everybody needs a Nathan. And that's a friend that tells you the truth. Yeah, I've got a few of them in my life. I got a couple of Nathans that'll be real candid, real raw, real upfront, real honest, real blatant, real brutal if necessary, but they will tell me the truth. In 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter in the 17th verse, and Nathan said to Jonathan, thou art the man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. And let me, let me give you context. In this chapter of 2 Samuel, you see Nathan rebuking David. David has, has listened to a parable that, that Nathan gave him about a, a small ewe, a, 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 little, a little animal that was raised with this family. It, it was a poor family, and they raised it, and they drank out of the same cup, and then there was a rich man. And the rich man came, and he took, because he had guests to come in town, he took the, the ewe, he took the, the baby of, of, of one of these, uh, of, of, the, of the poor family. And he used that to feed his rich friends. Now, David was incited and indignant about this. He says, listen, that's not okay. That person will have to pay for what they've done. And Nathan stepped to David and says, David, I'm glad to hear you say that. Why? Because the person is you. You're who I'm talking about. And he laid it out and showed him the error of his own ways. You need a friend that will tell you the truth. Most of us will get rid of these friends because these friends make us uncomfortable. These friends make us deal with the man in the mirror. These friends tell us the truth and are not caught up or messed up about losing friendship with you because you're offended by truth. 
Proverbs 27 and 5 through 6 says this. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. But faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy, they're deceitful. So you, you don't need people that always celebrate and pat you on the back and tell you how awesome and incredible you are. But you need some people in your life. You need a Nathan that will rebuke you and show you the error of your ways, not according to their opinion, but according to God's text. It re- that person reminds you of the consciousness of God. It brings you to a place where you remember that God is a God that we have to, to submit our lives to. And sometimes, because of our humanity, we get off course and we need to be pulled back into a place where he remains the sovereign one whom we submitted our life to. He would have gone, Nathan, uh, if had not told David, David would have gone his entire journey and not even realized that the Lord had left him that he had stepped away and stepped out of the will of God and nobody would have told him the truth because all the people in the court clearly did not feel confident enough. Even at the death of his child, they didn't even want to tell him that his baby had died. Why? Because they were subjects. But a friend in the prophet Nathan was found so that Nathan felt confident and comfortable enough to know I am here because God has assigned me to this. So I am here exclusively and simply to tell you you what thus saith the Lord and to show you what you're doing wrong. Everybody needs a Nathan. And the final one is that everybody needs a James. Yeah, a friend who can, who you can tell the truth. A Nathan is a friend that will tell you the truth, but a, 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 a James is a friend that you can tell the truth. In James 5 and 16, he simply says this, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Everybody needs a, a safe place that they can go to and find a sounding board that they can com- be completely vulnerable and naked and exposed. Yeah, be very careful in the selection of these last two, but be extra careful in the selection of this one because it doesn't say stand on the rooftop and confess your sins to everybody. It does not say confess your sins to the whole body. It says simply confess your your faults one to another. So this person needs to be proven and have fruitfulness that is exhibited as a person who is vested and rooted in God. Let me make sure I'm clear. I I don't tell everybody my business. It doesn't mean that I don't have faults. I'm just not going to stand here and equip the enemy with what he needs to kill me. Did you catch it? Make sure you got it. Because this person needs to be sifted through the fruit of, through, the, through the garden of God and come out with fruit that comes from God's grace in their lives. Yeah, but, but you have to have this friend. You have to build friendships and relationships that allow you to be vulnerable, allow you to be naked, allow you to be exposed. Because you need a person that can speak into it. And here's what I've learned. And I want to make sure you get this. Secrets are deadly. When I first started pastoring, my my pastor, Dr. Michael Reynolds, made this statement in the middle of a counseling session, and he said, listen, if you're not going to be honest, then there's no way we're going to be able to help you. I want to be here to help you. I want to support, but if you can't be candid, if you can't be forthright, if you can't be transparent, and and, and they wanted to bring information and insight and say, well, don't tell anybody I said it. And I love this because he he quickly taught me this lesson and said, listen, if you don't want me to say anything, don't say anything to me. Because the enemy lives in shadows. He, he, he operates in the dark spaces. We want to be children of light, which illuminates where we're going. So secrets are what destroy us. Secrets are what destroy marriages. Secrets are what destroy friendships. It destroys everything that, you, you, that, you, that is connected to it. So you want somebody whom will be in your life that you can be completely vulnerable and transparent with. You don't have to hide or cover your sin. You can be honest and that person will cover you and still speak truth and still minister to you. The person is so, this person is so critical because now you have someone that you can be vulnerable and exposed with. But get this, it is the seed or the source of your healing. God forgives sins, but faults are healed through relationships. Did you get it? 
God is going to wipe. He says, I'll take your sins and I'll cast them into a sea of forgetfulness and you will remember and I'll remember them no more. But but it is your relationships that are going to produce the healing that you need on the other side of it. You, you pay attention to the cross. The cross is our example. It is our plumb line. It is our template. It is our design. You, you need both relationships. Most of the time, we as believers feel we can get away with just having the vertical. But you note that the cross has a vertical line, but it also has a horizontal line, representing that there needs to be a vertical relationship, but you're not going to be fruitful and successful if you have no horizontal relationships. So those of you who have concluded, I'm just going to stay for myself. I'm just going to take this to the grave with me. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm just going to pray about it and it's going to be all right. No, you have to modify the deeds of the flesh and the way to do that is through relationships relationships with others can I can I show you right quick let me teach you this the only reason you learn patience is because you had people in your life that pulled it out of you yeah think about it go back go back through your list go back through some of the people that did not make your list go back through some of the people that you had to expel from your list the only reason you learn forgiveness that you learn God's healing capacity is because of the failed relationships that you had the only reason you knew that you had the ability to be such an extraordinary teacher is because you had to teach some people that you were in relationship with. So it is through your relationships that you're going to find healing. There is no body that gets beyond this need in their lives. You need relationships that allow you to be vulnerable so that you can experience the healing of God. You get healed through the connecting with people who will walk through it with you and bring you to a place of accountability but also bring you to a place of restoration and healing. When they pray, there is healing. When they talk to you, there is healing. When they minister to you, there is healing. When they show you your ways, there is healing. So everybody needs this type of friend. Let me go back through my list one more time because I want you to go through your list. I, I wanted you to write it at the beginning because I wanted you to know who you are actually making this reference to. Who is your Samuel? Look at your list. Who is your Samuel? Who is your Jonathan? Go back through. Check it out right now. See if you, who's, which one of these is my Jonathan? Uh, which, which one is my Nathan? Who, 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 is, who is my Nathan? And then lastly, which one on your list is your James? How many do you see? Do you see a Nathan? Come on, tell me in the chat room. Speak to me now. Do you see a Nathan? Do you see a Jonathan? You, you see a Nathan, a Nathan that sees the best in you, a Nathan that sees the potential, a Nathan that pulls the godliness, that, that, that operates and sees the things that God has invested in you. Do you see a Jonathan? A Jonathan that knows how to encourage you, a Jonathan that will pray you, your prayer warrior, your intercessor, your prayer partner. You see a Jonathan? What about, what about, what about a James? Does anybody see a James, a person that you can actually be transparent that will cover you in your nakedness, that, that, that knows where all the bodies are buried, that knows where, where all of the stuff happens and, and doesn't use it as a, a means of condemnation, but uses it as a, a, an effort to, to elevate you. Do, do, you see, do you see a Nathan? A Nathan that'll be raw with you. A Nathan that'll be real. Who do you see? Do you see these people on your list? Some of you right now, I can feel it in my spirit. You're saying, I, um, Pastor, I got two and a maybe. Yeah, or, or I got three in a maybe. You know how you talk. You know, what we, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, do you see these people on your list? If not, then that's what you need to begin to pray for. Is God, I need you to fix my list. I need you to give me spiritual discernment, give me wisdom, give me insight. I need you to give me relationship with the right people. And I need you to remove the people that don't need to be on my list. I need the strength to do that. So these are the four friends that everybody needs. And, and, and... <sighs> I guess I should be done here, but okay, it's not four. It's five. It's five. I, 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 have to, I have to amend that. I said four, but really it's five. There's a fifth friend that everybody needs. There's a fifth friend that everybody has to have. Because this friend is everything that these four are and so much more. In this friend, you find a Jonathan. In this friend, you find a James. In this friend, you find a Nathan. In this friend, you find a Samuel. But you also find so much more. You need this fifth friend. If you've never met this fifth friend, 
I want to introduce you to him today because this is the kind of friend that sticks closer than a brother. This is the friend that will be there when everybody else walks out. And this is the kind of friend that never fails you, that never will never leave you, never forsake you, never let you down. This is the kind of friend that you can always count on to be a protector. He'll fight for you. He says, move, I got it. The battle don't belong to you. I got this. This is a friend that will cover you, that will protect you. This is a friend that will shield you. This is a friend that you can go to at midnight and say, I need help. He says, I got you. What you need. This is the kind of friend that claims you when you've made your worst mistakes. The kind of friends that when you're fallen and when you feel unworthy and unqualified, this is the friend that says, but you're still my family. I still got you. We ride or die. This is the kind of friend that will lay down his life for you. This is the kind of friend that says, I love you so much. I'm going to look beyond your faults and I'll give up my own life so that you know you still have victory in me. This is that kind of friend. This is the friend that we sing about. This is the friend that we pray about. This is the friend that's been there. This is the friend that has existed for eons. This is the friend that will never go away. I want to introduce you to that friend. What a friend. Woo. What a friend we have in Jesus. And I love it because he's not the kind of friend that I'll claim and he doesn't turn around and claim me back. He says, no, I'll claim you and I'll call you friend. Well, I want to be in a relationship with you. I want to be friends with you. I want to, I want to have that kind of friend. What do I need to do? He says, it's easy. Romans 10, 9 and 10 makes it plain. It says, if you confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart that this friend was raised from the dead, I'll save you from eternal damnation and I'll give you access to eternity in heaven with me. And I'll even give you abundant life here. I'll be your comforter, your covering. And even when I'm not bodily here on earth, I'll leave a comforter who will literally show you everything you need to know. I'll guide you. I'll be a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your pathway. I'll be the words to the songs. I'll be the melody. I'll be sweet when everything in the world is sour. He says, I'm here for you. I got you. You've had friends walk out. You've had fake, phony, fickle, fair weather friends. I got you. You have friends that stabbed you in the back? Not me. I'm here to lift you. And I'll do it so the world knows I exalted you. I'll promote you when you're not qualified. Yeah, that's how much I, I love you. That's the kind of friend he is. I want you to meet him. If you haven't met him, I want you to meet him. Here it is. Here, here he is. His name is Jesus. Jesus, meet your new friends. Meet the people that are ready to embrace you. Meet the people who are ready to receive you. Meet your new friends. And I can hear him and his words reverberating through eternity saying it's a pleasure to meet you. I've been waiting on you. I've been waiting to meet you. You've been waiting to meet me? Yes. I've been here the whole time. Same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I've been waiting to meet you. I've known you before you knew yourself. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew everything about you. I know every hair on your head. I know things about you. I've been watching you and waiting on you to turn around and come over here so we can have a relationship. And now that you have this right relationship with me, I'll show you how to have the relationships with everybody else. It starts with me, but I got you. I'll be your friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. And what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No. Not one, no one else.
can heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. And I love him because Jesus knows all about our struggles. And he still loves us. And he will guide until till the day is done. Oh, I try them and I know there's not a friend like the Lord is Jesus. No, not one. No, Jesus. 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 There's just something about that name. Come on, I want you to meet him today. We're going to pray a prayer in a few minutes, but I want you to know him as Master, Savior, and he'll be your own personal Jesus. Oh, sweeter than the fragrance after the rain. Yeah, and when I'm in trouble, I call my friend. His name is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim kings, kings and kingdoms. They May all pass away, but I found a friend. And I'm happy to report there's still something, something about that name. If you want to meet him today, pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for keeping me alive for this meeting. I am honored to meet you. I accept you as the head of my life. I admit I've made mistakes, but I thank you for forgiving me. I believe you were born. Come on, say it. I believe you died. And by faith, I believe you were raised from the dead. With this confession, I'm excited to say I am saved. And with that profession, I'm excited to tell you you're his friend. He calls you friend. God, get the glory out of this moment. Open our eyes and unlock our capacity to see. Give us spiritual discernment. Give us wisdom and clarity of heart and clarity of mind and strength of heart. Help us to make the tough decisions and let those go that need to be released. And send us the ones that we need to have. You are our friend. Thank you for teaching us, modeling for us what friendship really looks like. And we pray that we honor you as we move forward in victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Check your list. It's going to be a great week, going to be a great rest of the year, and you got a great journey ahead of you. Check your list. It's about your friends.